Thank you, Pastor. It's our privilege to be here. And you have been so kind to us, taking us to the Wooden Spoon, and the Callahan's, and the Copeland's when you picked us up. We have eaten so well that we will be spoiled the rest of our lives, I think. So, uh, also, the presence of God has been so rich uh, these last few days. And even Saturday, you put up with me in my blue jeans. It's, my luggage was not here yet, so... It's been a great week, and we have enjoyed it, too. In this service, the uh, presence of God is just here blessing us. We feel that, and yes. we've talked about it, we're singing about it, but God is here just to love on us in a very sweet way and to bless us. And I want to get right behind what He is doing and just try to minister as He leads and directs us. So thank you so much. When we say thank you, uh, we're not just doing that out of rote or ritual, but we're very grateful for all the kindness that you have done in this church that has uh, sacrificed and have been so kind to us. Thank you so much. It's been our privilege to be here. I'm reading from Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and then we will flip over a few pages toward the last portion of the New Testament and go to Hebrews chapter 11 and begin reading at verse 13. So reading first from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he makes this declaration. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written here. The just shall live by faith. Yes. Powerful understanding of faith in these two verses. But I'm focusing mostly on his exclamation that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then from Hebrews chapter 11. Those of you who are familiar with this chapter know this is what we affectionately call the Hall of Faith chapter. Because throughout this chapter, the writer of Hebrews lists great men and women of God that walked in faith and lived in faith and even died in faith. And, of course, it mentions, as you would expect, Abraham, who we call the father of the faithful, and Sarah. And so I'm picking up in verse 13. Verse 13 says that these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They're, they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they come out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And I will be uh, very short here tonight, in particular in comparison to some of the other messages that have been spoken this weekend. But I simply want to preach not ashamed. Not ashamed. God bless you. You may be seated. I believe I understand Paul's exclamation when he writes to the church at Rome and he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. There's something within me that I want to shout it everywhere I go. I want to use wisdom as the scripture declares, but I want everyone to know about the gospel yes. of Jesus yes. Christ. Something within me wants to get on the rooftop and with a megaphone just shout it out. There's nothing like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. I have opportunity to be in many restaurants and oftentimes, and maybe you'll understand this, oftentimes 
when a waiter or a waitress comes up to help us as it was last night. They will speak to us as a group and fresh from being in the presence of God and the giftings still stirring in my heart. I can begin to see some things in their life and, and I want to jump up and just minister to them but they're at work. <laughs> They didn't come to church. They're at work. And you have to be careful not to offend. You have to be wise. And you have to be, be, be sensitive to the Spirit of God as well as sensitive to the Spirit of others. And there have been times that God has directed me even in places like that. But I want to speak it to individuals and to minister to individuals and to shout it because, because there's nothing like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, yeah. What else but the gospel can take an individual addicted perhaps to alcohol or drugs or porn and let the gospel of Jesus Christ get a hold of them and it will make them a new creature in Christ Jesus. Even the desires that they physically and emotionally had will be changed and they will be a different individual. There's nothing that can do that like the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel can take a young person who has wasted the innocence of their youth and perhaps the heritage of their raising up in a Christian home because they have given themselves to pleasures of the sin and to riotous living as the prodigal son had. But let the gospel get a hold of them again. And you'll see the tears of repentance flow down their face. And a forgiveness come upon their life. And God will do more than just forgive them. But he will call them and anoint them and choose them to be powerful in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his kingdom. What else but the gospel does that? Not ashamed of the gospel. Only the gospel can take a marriage it's fallen apart. Maybe they have read the best books they can read and have been to the best counselors. But let the gospel get in the heart of both of that husband and that wife. And now a brand new love will live in that home. And their home will be a haven of peace and strength. And, and they'll be such an example for the children that are being raised in that home. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can do that. So I understand what Paul declares in Romans when he declares there's nothing like the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed to speak it. I'm not ashamed to declare it. I'm not ashamed to testify it. When I read Hebrews, and it declares that God is not ashamed to be called their people. Now I have a little bit of a harder time accepting and believing that God is not ashamed of me. I think perhaps because most of us derive our value based on our accomplishments. And when we try to measure whether or not God is pleased with me, whether or not God is not ashamed, or whether or not God is proud of me, then we began to look at our Christian walk and the things that we need to do for Him and in relationship with Him. And usually when I do this, and I'm sure you would confess also, I feel like I fall so far short. Because when I consider prayer integral part of my relationship with God, and I think even on the last few days or perhaps last couple of weeks, and it's been powerful even around here, but if I ask myself the question, have I prayed enough this week? I'd hang my head and say, well... I could have prayed more. I, I could have gave myself a little more. I could, I could have spent more time. I, I could have, I could have prayed more fervently. I could have focused. I could have done so much more. Would anybody in the place agree with me that you could have prayed more? And so we try to determine whether or not God 
is pleased with us, whether he or not, he's ashamed of me because of how much I have prayed or perhaps have not prayed. Integral part of living for God is worship. And there's been powerful worship even the last few days around here. But I would confess to you that God has been so good to me. I, I, I could have worshipped more than I have. I, I, could have, I could have focused more and really gave myself a little more. I, I have more energy than what I expected. I, I could have worshipped more. Anybody feel like that? You could have worshipped more. Yes, you worshipped awesome and great, but we, we could have worshipped. And somehow, if I'm trying to find my value or whether or not God is ashamed of me, I could have prayed more. I could have worshipped more. I could have fasted more than what I had. This year I could have I could have ministered more. Did I reach out and witness to enough people? Well, I could have done more. Yeah. And when I try to evaluate, is God happy with me? Is he ashamed to be called my God? I I cannot find even one place in my Christian walk or in my calling or my anointing where I have to say, yeah, God's proud of me because of this. Because in every area, I could have done more and probably should have done more. It bothers me sometimes, and I hope you understand this. It bothers me sometimes when we evaluate revivals. We say, wow, we had powerful services and revival was awesome. And someone will say, well, how many received the Holy Ghost? One, two, whatever the answer is. And the complete value on whether or not God came into the place yeah. and had His perfect will is on a number of who did or who didn't respond in certain ways. Thank God. For every person that repents. And heaven is rejoicing. And yeah, angels right. are throwing parties. And thank God for every individual that commits. And is baptized in yeah. Jesus name. And celebration is throughout the, the yeah. spiritual universe. And thank God for the resurrection power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. But yeah. somehow we will never have enough people pray through in our services. Or enough repent. Or enough baptized. Right. To somehow say... We had a revival because of this number. We always feel like we could have done more. In fact, we try to even find value by measuring ourselves among ourselves, which is not wise. And we determine whether or not we're valuable by seeing if we've prayed more, or ministered more, or have more powerful anointing, or more in our services, or more this and more that. We're not wise. The reason why we're not wise is because this is not how God determines whether or not He's proud of us. Whether He's not ashamed. Well, when we began to look here, Hebrews chapter 11, it speaks of this great hall of faith. And Abraham has spent several verses here, more than any other individual in this passage and it speaks about how he was called and he went into the place and he obeyed because he had a covenant promise with Jehovah God that if you would come covenant relationship with me I will bless you and the promises that God gave Abraham are huge yes. I'm going to make your seed like the stars of the sky and the seashore sand innumerable. Yeah. All the nations of the world will be blessed through you yeah. and you will be a father of many nations. Wow. And so Abraham begins his revival promise. And he starts walking with God. And he starts talking with God. And he, he can't talk anybody into coming to church. He hasn't prayed anybody through when he's 50 years old, 60 years old. Now he's 70 and the promise that God has spoken to him is nowhere in sight. 
He doesn't have any children. That's his promise. He doesn't have any new converts. That's parallel. He doesn't have anybody get the Holy Ghost. He doesn't have anybody praying through. He doesn't have any visitors come. And he's been promised a revival like the stars in the sand. Matter of fact, Hebrews tells us he actually gets to the place that he doesn't physically have the ability to reproduce anymore. It was as good as dead, his ability to reproduce. And that's when God gives him that one promised, recognized son of promise, Isaac. And he's a hundred years old. Sarah is nine. Can you imagine, though, what all of his friends back in the Ur of Chaldees thought when he began to tell them, God has called me, and he has anointed me. I'm going to be separate, not like everybody else. There's places I'm going to go, places I'm not going to go, things I'm going to do and not do because I'm walking with him. But he has promised me. This is not a sacrifice because he has promised me blessing. And I'm going to be the father of nations. Yeah. Yeah. And now he's 60, 70, 80. He has no children. And all his friends back in Ur Chaldees are saying, Oh, here comes the father of many nations. Where is his promise? Walking with his God. He's getting so old now in his upper 80s, in his 90s, you know. He's not even going to have children. He looks like the biggest failure in the entire world of people who have covenant with God. In comparison to his promise, he has But this is one of those that is called father of the faithful. But the scripture says this. These all died in faith. They believed till their last breath what God had promised them. And when they crossed Jordan's rolling tide and went on to their eternity, they were still believing the promises of God. They all died in faith, not having received the promises. Or in context, I would say it this way. They not have received the fulfillment of their promises. But having seen them afar off, this is key. Because these are the ones that God is not ashamed of. They ain't completed the promises yet. All the prophecies haven't come to pass yet. All the things that God has spoken and called and anointed have not come to pass yet. But they still have the vision. They still see it. And it might be a long ways off in time. It might be a long ways off in distance. But they still have the vision. God has given me a promise. And I still see it. I still see it. I still dream of it. I still believe it. One of the key elements of those he's not ashamed of. Not those that are living every bit of what God has promised them and they've accomplished everything that they want to accomplish in God. But who he's not ashamed of is those that see the vision even though it's not come to pass. And secondly, it's also those that are persuaded of them. Those have become so made up in their mind that you can't convince them that they missed it. You can't convince them that they dreamed too big. They, they are persuaded that what God said He would perform, that He is the author and the finisher of their faith or their promises. And even though it looks like it's a long ways off, they are persuaded it is going to happen. And you can't change their will or their mind. Next dimension lets us know that they embraced them. They embraced the promise 
They embraced what God had spoken. That means it became precious to them. And they held it close yes. to their heart. And they didn't let anybody steal it away. And it became something that in their love for it, it drives them when there's not much answer. It motivates them when nobody else sees what they see and believes what they yeah. believe because Amen. they love it and they embrace it and they hold it close to their heart and they're always loving on it and looking at it and remembering it and they're holding it close in their eyes, their spirit, and in their heart. They embrace yes. Embrace it. Next dimension declares, confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You've got to see this mindset. That where they are right now, they are sojourners. They are. They're not citizens. Because who they are is citizens of the promise. Yes. So until the promise is here, they're just going through this journey where they're at. When God begins to speak to us as a church, that He will double us, that there is a hundred soul revival among yes. us, then we that believe it and accept it and persuade it and embrace it don't even feel comfortable until the promise is here. We are not citizens of where we're at now. We're just passing through this place. We're not even one that was set up residence here. We are. Then it declared that. They that say such things plainly say they seek a country. And if they'd been mindful, they could have gone back. They could have gone back. They could have said, well, I dream too big. Let me settle down somewhere. They could have said, maybe I missed it a little bit. and I'm just going to back up. And maybe in my age, I'm not as young and strong as I used to be, so therefore I will just begin to step back. But those that he's not ashamed of declare plainly they're seeking the promise, the country, yes. Yes. and that they will not quit walking. 16, now they desire a better country that isn't heavenly. Wherefore, wherefore, because of all these things in their spirit, Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Maybe I have not prayed the greatest prayer, but I can still see myself going to that closet and intercession coming upon me. And as I begin to pray, reaching toward heaven, grabbing a nail-scarred hand of love and compassion and mercy. And as I'm praying, reach with the other hand and grab a hand that is on fire and going into a devil's hair, hell of some loved one that is about to slip into their eternity. And I pray the prayer like I have never prayed before. And chains are broken and angels are dispersed. And an intercessory prayer, sinners once again find grace. They, well, I, maybe I haven't prayed that prayer like I dream of praying yet. But I'm going to do it today. I've got it in my heart tomorrow. I, I'm looking at this week being oh, yeah. the week that I will do that, that I'll find that place. I'm not giving up on the dream, the dream, the promise, the anointing, the yeah. calling that God has put oh, in yeah. my spirit. Amen. I have envisioned just knocking on the doors. But this time, as they come to the door, tears in my eyes, testimony on my lips, let them know that I would not even be here except for the mercy of God. Yeah. And that God had saved me this and helped me here and healed me here. Sure. And watch conversions happen in living rooms and on porches. Maybe, maybe I just touched that, but I can see that that's where God is called. Tremendous revival in these past four days, and I don't, these past three days, I don't know anybody that has been attending here that would feel like that they have been a failure. 
but perhaps when others that have not been here want to know what happened in your church services. I don't know how you can explain spiritual warfare. I don't know how you can explain liberty, gifts of the Spirit, and demonstration, and lives that have been confirmed and changed, and repentance and miracles. I, I don't know that you can just say that. But I still believe what God has spoken to us. That our sin yes. will be turned upside yes. down yes. by what happens yes. in our church services. Yes. yes, people receiving the Holy Ghost. Yes. Signs, wonders yes. among our community. Yes. We've not seen the fullness of it happen, but I, I still see it. I still see it. I still see it. I'm persuaded it's going to happen. I embrace it. It is my heartbeat. It is my hunger, my desire. I declare I'm not going back. I'm not going to believe any lesser promise, any lesser dream. I know what God has spoken, and I will declare it. Believe it. Walk in it. This is not a message you will hear often preached. For in our humanity, we need seemingly the opposite so much. It seems like we always need to be encouraged to do more. And hopefully this message still is encouraging. That we should pray more. That we should, that we should study and read the Word more. And know Him more through His Word. And that we, we should give ourselves to disciplines of Christianity. And, and we should fast and separate. All these things that, that we should do more. And that's what we hear so much more. You need to do more. You need to do more. You need to do more. But every once in a while we need to hear what God is telling us from Hebrews. That He is not ashamed. And He is proud because you are still on the journey. And you are still believing. And you are still in fact, if we don't hear this on occasion, condemnation will begin to try to steal our joy in our relationship, in our peace, in our walk with God. And we'll begin to feel like we never measure up. This is the opportunity for us to look at our Heavenly Father, perhaps even with boo-boos on hands and knees for him to come and say so proud of you. you might have fallen, you might have made mistakes you might not have made the A that we thought you was going to make on the report card but man you are still in the fight you're still here, you're still believing, you're still trusting, you're still knowing the anointed call upon you and you're believing it's going to happen just any place anywhere Would you just close your eyes all over the place? Get that mental picture of what God is trying to do. That as a heavenly father to you as his child, he's trying to reach to you in acceptance. He's trying to reach to you in proudness. He's trying to let you know he's not ashamed to be called your God. I have seen some of the most powerful things happen. I have seen in the Holy Ghost individuals who had a calling to preach upon their life. In particular, I remember many, but this one in particular, a man was sitting beside his wife in church, had a calling to preach in his life. His giftings were not strong in areas of exhortation, stage fright. He had a background that did not help him in the gift and the calling of being a preacher. But I began to see something in his life. That the anointing that God had spoke to him about was starting to rest upon his son. But it's incumbent upon the son's anointing that the father never gives up on the promise.
Because Abraham is not going to see his promise fulfilled in his lifetime. But because he dies in faith, Isaac has the promise still alive. Isaac doesn't see the promise in his lifetime. Only two children. Esau and Jacob. But because Isaac dies in the faith, still believing the promise of his father Abraham, Jacob receives the same promise. And it's two generations from Abraham's promise until you began to see the twelve tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, and the nation that God had promised just beginning to happen. But it will never happen in Jacob's generation unless Abraham dies believing the promise. Because when God gives us the promise, it looks like our promise. Because we see it being fulfilled through us and in us. We see the completion of it and believe that it's going to happen in what I do, what I say, what I live. It's going to happen in my ministry, my call, in my lifetime. But the promises is not just your promise. It's God's promise. Yes. Yes. And some promises are generational promises. But it will never be fulfilled generation after you or the preceding generation after that, unless you die still believing yes. the promise. Yes. Amen. I know of elders that have preached some of the most powerful prophetic messages of end time revival that they believe it would happen in their lifetime. Even the Apostle Paul said, we which are alive and remain He'll be called up together to be with him in the air. The rapture happens because Paul believed it would be any day. 2,000 years ago. And even though I heard my elders preach back in the 70s, it could happen this year in 77. And I heard it again in 95, it could be this year. I still declare God could come right now. Like has been said before, every prophecy has already been declared and fulfilled. There's nothing holding it back. The gospel has been preached to the entire world as far as we know. And it can happen right here, right now. But if it doesn't for another thousand years, and I don't believe by any stretch of the imagination, but if it doesn't, I still declare the rapture. It's any moment. Yeah. It's going to happen. And I'm going to be called away alive to meet him in the sky. Yes. By the same token, the end time revival that will spread across this world, I believe it's right now. I believe I see it on a daily and weekly basis. But if somehow, and I don't understand how, but if somehow it's still an end time that is far beyond, I'll breathe my last breath believing that it's going to happen right now. Because when that generation, my generation, or perhaps the generation of young people being raised now, when that generation, that is the last generation, that promise has to be handed to them a lot. Yeah. Yes. Cover the promise before yes. God. Yes. Yes. I see this in individuals. Where that man I was speaking to you about would probably never stand behind a pulpit at a conference or a meeting. Perhaps he would teach maybe somewhere or, or have an opportunity here or there to preach in a prison. Even though he dreams of preaching to a conference. He'll never do that. But I watch that anointing that's upon him because he never lets go. Yeah. Begin to settle upon a young son that is in his home. And a son that is talented and gifted, have heritage, begin to walk down in that path. Yes. There are elders. I feel to speak to elders. Please. Elders in this place that God has spoken to you about gifts of the Spirit operating in your lifetime. About you seeing healing on a mass level. 
about you seeing miracles, signs, and wonders operating in your church service just beautifully like that. And you have believed it and you have saw it. And many have said, well, them days are gone. And if you don't let go, that this could be the day that everybody in the place is healed. That every cancer, every sugar diabetes, every arthritis, that every sickness and disease and pain is gone because we believe that's kind of miracle God wants to do in our church. It might happen right here, right now. And it might be just down the road. But we need to breathe our last breaths believing. The promises God has spoken. I feel it more intimate, more, uh, more close, more, more quickly than what I ever have. But I am recalling, and rarely do I do this, I recall what was spoken prophetically from this pulpit maybe last or the year before. But I saw in this city, and I see it clearly again, at least two churches or groups of people that are uncomfortable with where they're at, hungry for more of God. The problems within their church has caused them to look. And I see God raising this assembly up, especially here in Siloam Springs, raising this assembly up to be that light on the hill so that they can see where truth is and they can see where hope is and they can see where God is leading and guiding. This church is just going to have mass entrance of groups of people who are already loving God and walking with God in the measure that they know and believe and understand. Truth is, I thought, as I saw that last year or maybe two years ago when I first saw it, that it would, that it already happened by now. And I don't see that that's been fulfilled. Maybe just a partial of it. But I can believe that it might even happen right now as I'm preaching. Or it might be Sunday morning when you make the sacrifice and the effort and you come back in here next week. It's Sunday afternoon. You've already been to different things and you've brought yourself back to church and, and all of a sudden there's 30, 40, 50, 60 people from different places. It, it could be next. But you've just got to see the vision, even if it's a long ways off. You've got to see the promise, even if it's a long ways off. You, you've got to be persuaded that this is of God and what He said He will fulfill. You've got to embrace it and bring it close to your heart. You've got to say, I'm not going back. I don't even feel comfortable here. I'm not a citizen here. You've got to embrace the promise. And when you do that, it's not once you get there he's proud of you. But it's right now. He's busted his suspenders. He's, he's proud to be called your God. Not a shame for him to be your God. I want you to stand with me and just entertain an atmosphere of worship. God has spoken to me, a few individuals to minister to I want to speak that as God gives us liberty and as you give me liberty in the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. 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 Let me speak to you again. Yes. I don't know if I've ever spoken this much to one individual to me. But this, this is different than what I've been feeling because God let me see it so clear. Your promises of anointing and calling and stuff strong upon your life. That's been confirmed. And God's given you fresh vision, fresh direction. But there's also a prayer that the Holy Ghost has let me see you pray. And perhaps 
even to the degree that you have written things down in the past. I don't know if it's a diary, but you've written things down where you have said, God, not only do I want to do this and fulfill the call upon my life, but, but I want you to prepare a man that loves you, God, like I love you, and one that has an anointing and a calling upon his life like you have called and anointed me. And I see that God has spoken promises to you. And like a fire of anointing that you are giving yourself to, he also is written, being in him a fire developing and a fire beginning to rise. And as you let God, God will begin to join you. And the two of you will do more together than what you ever would be able to do by yourself. It's a fire of anointing and calling. You've got to get that dream back off the shelf and say, I still believe that God will fulfill and His purpose will happen. A blessing as well as it is. All that condemnation. All that condemnation has to leave right now. <laughs> it's not that you're too picky. It's not that this is not the path. It's that Holy Ghost is prepared in perfect timing. <laughs> Bishop, let me speak to you. I'm always very careful when I speak to the shepherd of the church. There is a powerful, unique anointing upon your ministry. It's why God has spoken of hundred soul revivals and of doubling congregations. It's because that's what He wants to happen. But He has given you a tremendous anointing and gifting to raise up ministries. Just as Jesus raised up Simon Peter and the raised up James and John and discipled them and then on the day of Pentecost 3,000 added and then 5,000 added and then multitudes added that much of your life has gone into preparation and discipling and teaching ministries but you will see with your physical eyes the revival that has been promised to you began to happen and it will happen in your seed spiritually as they are turned loose and anointed and given giftings that God has placed in life in which you have felt this life. Promises of God are yea and amen. Receive it, man of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. First lady. I know we have said this and we have referred to it in the physical way, but it's a spiritual thing. That when my wife and I look at you, we just, we see classy. You're a classy lady. But that's more than your attire. It's more than the way you physically carry yourself. It's, it's your spirit. And people look to you and see this. This is what a beautiful lady of God should look like. And there's a powerful mantle and anointing that has fallen upon your daughter. But I see it even upon some of your grandchildren. And even the fact that this young lady is standing beside you in the church. It's not just a desire for her to stand beside you. It's, but it's a desire for the mantle and anointing that you have. And then her heart is a hunger for things of God. Baby dog God is going to give you dreams in the night time. And when you awake, you'll feel the presence of God. You'll remember the dreams. You'll share them with your parents. And God will give you a dream that will speak to the church. That will confirm things. You'll begin to dream things even in the daytime. And you, the dreamer, will begin to see even in your generation some of the things that God has spoken fulfillment even in generations before my God, my God. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, 
I feel to speak this. I feel to speak this prophetically to the city. That generations and years upon years of ministry has been spoken to this city. That a powerful revival. That a church will arise from here that will be seen and recognized even all over this region. But while others might not have loved the precious things of God. And while others might not have valued the special things of the kingdom. There is yet a people. There is yet a group. There is yet people even beyond this congregation that love it, that hunger for it. And that believe that promise. Yeah. Your greatest revival, Salons preach, is still in the future. Receive it in Jesus' name. sent me specifically back here to talk to you. Because you have heard a lot of words trying to beat you down. Even the home you've raised. Even the relationships that you've had over the years. Trying to beat you down, tear you down. Until you have felt like you can't hope for certain things. You can't believe for certain things. That's, that's what the enemy would do. I know that you're not perfect, and I know that there's still things that God is working in your life, my sister. But I want you to know what I feel God telling me to tell you is that he's, he's proud of you. Because here you are. It's Monday night, and you're in church lifting your hands, tears flowing down your face, and you might not have everything perfect, but you're worshiping me. And the enemy would tell you that much of what your family deals with is because of the choices you made. And now you're just, they're getting what you have made and the choices and the seeds have been sold. But God is saying you're here. You're sowing good seed. Your prayer and your worship is going to bring a harvest upon your family as well. Just keep believing. Just keep receiving. He's proud of the steps. Love of God is upon you. I feel a revival is about to happen in your home. If you believe it, just pray the Holy Ghost right now. It will solidify your faith. It's a revival in my home. join me here. There's no way I can speak to every individual in this place. Time would not permit. But the Holy Ghost will speak to you individually if you will let him. So if you will just allow yourself to hear what God is trying to say, that in this altar in just the next few moments, your Heavenly Father is going to embrace you. He's going to start talking to you. Not just love you because he's a loving God, but he's going to tell you why he's not ashamed. It's because you still see the promise. You still believe. You're still walking with him. And you're still striving and pushing and pressing that you're not giving up. In fact, this. In fact, this. I was reading today. Don't fully understand everything that is being spoken here. But in Luke chapter 9, powerful things are spoken. As Jesus is calling different individuals. And he speaks to one and says, follow me. And they say, well, 
Lord, I'll follow thee wherever you go. He said, well, I, I don't have a den like fox have to lay my head. And I don't have a nest like birds have. But the Son of Man has not these comforts. Do you still want to follow me? And then another he speaks to and says, follow me. But they say, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. That, that sounds like such a reasonable request. And the Lord says that the dead bury the dead. But you go and preach. And then one more says, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me just go home and bid those in the house goodbye. And Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Because when God calls people, he speaks promises and blessings to them, and some will die in the faith. Not having received the fullness of their promise. But in heaven's portals, Hebrews chapter 11 will continue past verse 40 into verse 41. And it will say of this individual that even died before their children came back to God. But after they were in the grave, they came back because God said, You still believed and you never let go. You even died not having seen the fulfillment. Jesus says it so strongly. Matter of fact, you're not even fit. You're not a good fit for the kingdom of God. Unless when you began to walk this way, you say, this is what my life is going to be. And I believe every promise, everything he has spoken. And I will believe it when he fulfills it. Or if he doesn't fulfill it in my lifetime, I still believe it. That's the ones that he's not ashamed. So I want you to look at your situation and I want you to begin to lift your hands to a heavenly father and just make that commitment fresh again. Commit to the vision. <laughs> commit to the promises. Commit, commit to what God has prophesied to you. That you're going to believe it till your dying day or until you see it fulfilled. And from that place, Heaven's arms will wrap around you now. The love of God will minister to you now and let you know that you are loved. That he is not ashamed. Minister, would you help us just pray? I want to move to the altars. There's different ones that need prayer. There's different ones that need personal encouragement. If you would help us on the keyboards as well. We're just going to entertain God for just a few moments of worship. But different individuals need to hear some specific things of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus.